Hi there, welcome to my lab. Today I'd like to talk about helicopter coning, feathering and flapping, uh, the relationship between feathering and flapping, and how that is uh, 90 degrees apart, where uh, flapping lags feathering by 90 degrees. So we're going to go into that today and discuss that. This would be more like for a single rotor helicopter that had collective, longitudinal cyclic, and lateral cyclic pitch. And we're also going to talk about the coning angle, uh, how to compute that uh, based off the centrifugal force and the mass of the rotor and the lift. Uh, the, the blades tend to cone up. So we're going to talk about that also today. See you soon. So today I want to talk about helicopter blade coning and feathering the flapping. And this would be for a conventional single rotor helicopter with a tail rotor. Uh, also, um, other types of helicopters, uh, tandem rotors and tilt rotors and coaxial helicopters, uh, anything that uses uh, longitudinal cyclic and lateral cyclic pitch uh, could, uh, could apply to this. So we're going to talk about coning as a function of blade lift. The coning angle of the rotor blade in many typical helicopters may be approximately equal to the collective pitch angle. So in a lot of typical helicopters, uh, the coning angle is approximately the collective pitch angle, but um, they could be different. However, they may be slightly different or could be very different. Since in a simplified analysis, the lift is determined from these angles, it may cause some error in the analysis. The coning angle is a function of the centrifugal force and the lift of the blade as shown in the following figure. So let's look at this figure here. So this figure here depicts a blade. Uh, this would represent the rotor blade where it was, but as it spins around and gets some lift, it would uh, displace, it would, it would rotate up a little bit to some fixed angle. So we call this the coning angle. And what it is, it's uh, the, the, to determine what this angle is going to be, it, uh, when this, when the rotor is still, when it's uh, stable and holding a, a steady load, it, it occurs when uh, the centrifugal force, this uh, vector here, the green arrow here, is equal to the lift, the lift force. So when these two forces, shown in purple, this this rep represent the lift force, and this would represent the force from the centrifugal force. So when those two are equal, the blade will stop and hold the position. So this would be our coning angle. So the centrifugal force, which is generally very high in uh, helicopter rotor blades, is represented by this red arrow. It, it kind of shoots out uh, parallel to the, to the path of rotation, to the axis of rotation. And... Um, and what's going to happen, it's going to be pulling this blade. Now, we assume that this blade has a mass that's distributed along the blade. So we pick the center of mass. That would be R over 2, this position here that the centrifugal force works on. The centrifugal force needs a mass to generate a force. It's an acceleration. But to compute the force, we need to have a mass. So we're assuming that it uh, that it's actually parallel to the the axis of rotation, the plane of rotation of the blade. So there's a component here that's perpendicular to the blade. That would be the sine of this force. So the sine of this angle times the force would be this little component here. So that's um, that would be uh, FC times the sine of the coning angle. And so we sum the moments. When the moments are zero, that's when we know this will be still, will be static at that point. So it's the centrifugal force, that's Fc, times the sine of this angle, times this, this crank arm. This crank arm is R over 2. So that's the moment from the centrifugal force. And then we have the moment from the lift. So the lift is the lift of the rotor, and we know the center of pressure is three quarters of the radius over uh, of the radius, so it would be three r over four. So when the centrifugal force with this crank arm is equal to the lift force with this longer crank arm, then this blade will be still. And from that we can compute the 
coning angle. So if we uh, solve for the sine of the co coning angle, the R's cancel, and it's equal to the lift of the rotor over the centrifugal force times 3 divided by 2. So you have to take the inverse sine of that to determine this coning angle. So why is this important? Well, it's important because we need to, if we want to compute our Z force, we need to know this angle. Uh, so we would take the lift and the Z force would be the cosine of this angle times times the lift would give us our Z or vertical force to know if we could counteract the weight of the helicopter. So that's why this is important to know. And in a lot of helicopters, the collective pitch closely, uh, for some reason, the way the physics works out closely matches this coning angle. So in a lot of cases, we can ignore the coning angle and just use our collective pitch for this. But there could be some differences. So um, so maybe if it's a slight difference, so we don't worry about it. But if it's a big difference, yeah, then you have to use the coning angle rather than the collective pitch uh, to figure out what the vertical force would be. So let's look at the some of the wording here. So assuming a rotor system with a free-moving flapping hinge. So we're assuming that there's no springs in here, that this is just free in the air to move. It's just a bearing. Uh, it's not a elastomeric type of rotor, it's just the standard, what we call the articulated rotor, which is uh, free, free to move, uh, it's just a centrifugal force, and the lift determine what the position of this, this would be. There's no spring. Some of the more modern helicopters have rigid rotors where, where this, this area bends, so in that case, it's a, a different story, and you have to in, include uh, the bending of, of this uh, structure. But we're going to talk about the articulated rotor where this is free to move. So assuming a rotor system with a free moving flapping hinge, when the sum of the moments around its hub is zero, the coating angle is determined by the centrifugal force and the lift of the blade. The centrifugal force will be a function of the mass of the blade. So this is something that is a function of the mass. So uh, the centrifugal force, the heavier the blade, uh, the higher the force will be. The lift will be a function of collective and cyclic pitch. So cyclic pitch uh, is composed of lo longitudinal cyclic pitch and lateral cyclic pitch. It is assumed the mass center of the blade will be in its center. That's R over 2. So that's easy to assume. You could assume that uh, the mass is really distributed among the blade. But if you want to, say, uh, pick a point where the force works on, if you pick the center, that's uh, pretty good assumption. So when the force vector from the centrifugal force shown in green is equal to the force vector from lift shown in purple, the rotor will stop moving and settle to its coning position. So when these two vectors are equal, as the blade moves up, uh, when the forces, these two forces become equal, the, the, they will cancel and the blade will stop moving and hold that position. So the centrifugal force will be Omega squared Rm, so this would be the mass of the rotor blade, the radius of the rotor blade, and this is the rotational speed of the rotor squared and over 2. Now it's over 2 because it's we're assuming that the force works on the center of mass, which would be uh, the radius over 2, which is a good assumption. So the rotor blade will stop moving and coning when the sum of the moments is 0. So this is... When this moment, this is uh, the centrifugal force, and this is the vector that's perpendicular to the blade, and this is the crank arm. So when the centrifugal force times the sine of the coning angle times the radius over 2, this crank arm, when that moment is equal to this moment, which is the lift of the rotor times 3R over 4, so this would be the center of pressure that the lift works on, that's when the rotor blade stops, when these two moments are equal to each other. Um, that would be the sum of the moments is zero. Then, then this is the balance equation where we could figure out what, what this coning angle is. The object of this is to figure out what this coning angle is. So theta c is the coning angle can be computed using the following equation. So uh, if we uh, rearrange this equation here, we put the sign over here. And uh, we move the 2, so we have 6 over 4, which is 3 halves. And uh, we just uh, take our uh, 
LR divided by RSC, so our, our lift of the rotor over the centrifugal force. So three halves of that would be uh, what our coating angle is. So we could further um, include the centrifugal force, plug in the centrifugal force here, and then we get three times the lift of the rotor over the rotational speed square times the radius times the mass. So that, that would be another way to compute this coning angle. So if we look at our picture of the helicopter, again, this is the side view. Uh, we could see um, this coning angle here. And this is a case where the longitudinal psychic pitch is zero. So these uh, X force factors are equal. And this would be uh, the lift of the blade is always perpendicular to the blade. And we, if we want to figure out our Z forces, we would use this coning angle. It gets a little more complicated because you, you might have to add in uh, the longitudinal, so the factor of the longitudinal cyclic pitch, but being at zero, this is a pretty good uh, figure here. So these would actually be the coning angles. Theta one would be a blade one, and theta three would be a blade three. And this is a four bladed helicopter example, or blade four would be pointing out towards the picture, and blade, uh, uh, and blade two would be going this way into the picture. So here's the pitch for each blade. Uh, being pitch, we mean feathering. Feathering and pitch are the same thing. Uh, that is used to compute the lift of the blade. So we have our uh, collective pitch, and this is our longitudinal cyclic, which is uh, a function of the azimuth of the rotor. And this is our lateral cyclic, which also is also a function of the azimuth. So this X represents the blade number. So in our case, in this example, we have uh, four blades. So it would be like X would be equal to one, two, three, or four, and they're all 90 degrees apart. So this would be the azimuth of blade one would be zero, and the azimuth of blade two would be 90. The azimuth of blade three would be 180 degrees. The azimuth of blade four would be 270 degrees. And this omega T uh, represents um, the rate times the time, which is actually the azimuth of the blade. So here's the lift of each blade due to feathering. So we would use this, this result here. This is um, not the coning angle, but the collective pitch. And this is longitudinal cyclic and lateral cyclic. So our, li our lift would be the coefficient of lift times the average dynamic pressure times the surface area times this angle here which would be which would make up the collective and longitude and lateral cyclic so this would represent the lift for each of our blades on the rotor so now we want to get our coning angle for each blade so our coning angle would be uh, we uh, derived this equation previously would be three halves and it would be the lift uh, x is the rotor and the centrifugal force you could say would be the same for all the rotors um, would have the same, uh, you assume they all have the same mass. Uh, it's possible they could have different mass, uh, uh, but uh, uh, that would become a vibration problem. But uh, uh, so if you had a vibration, yeah, you, you would have uh, upsets in the coning angle. But, um, but we, we're assuming for this analysis that uh, the centrifugal force is the same for all the blades. So we could go plug in our omega R M, and we're assuming the mass is the same for all the blades, and the radius is the same. And if we further uh, expand this and we put the, the lift in, it would be three times the coefficient of lift times our average dynamic pressure times the surface area times this angle isn't the coning angle. It's this angle here that makes up the collective pitch, the longitude and lateral. So we want to derive, say, our coning angle from we're basically deriving that as a function of our of our pitch of the blade. If we don't have any longitude or lateral, then it's basically our collective pitch. So from that, we can compute our z-force, and uh, our z-force is uh, uh, po uh, positive is down, so negative is up. Uh, if you look at some of the previous uh, lessons I gave on single rotor helicopter, I go in, into the derivation of this. So this is. Just giving you a little bit more uh, information relative to coning angle, because before we just used uh, collective pitch for our coning angle. So anyway, so the Z force is the Z of, of that particular uh, rotor blade. The vertical force is equal to minus the lift. Um, 
because uh, the opposite polarity times the cosine of the uh, coning angle that goes back to here that's these z's over here so the sum of our z forces uh, if you want to get the total z force we would add up all four of these for a four bladed rotor system if it was a three bladed rotor system it would be three of them however in many helicopters um the uh the coning angle is approximately equal to the collective pitch that usually tells you you have a good design if they're if they're very much different then you know there's some kind of issue possibly with the design uh so so that's always uh, a good marker to know if it's a good design or not and so we could say the uh coning angle is approximately equal to this uh this angle which is uh, made up of the collective and longitudinal and lateral cyclic pitch so the following equation may work as well so so whether you use the uh uh the collective pitch or the coning angle in fact i want to uh uh, change this. This this would be uh, uh, you, we uh, we want to change this. Make a little change here. This uh, we'll just call this X here. So we'll take out the C and we'll put that X. So this so this equation may work just as well as that equation. Uh, whether you use the coning angle or the overall pitch, uh, this would be the collective and longitude and lateral cyclic pitch. And that's what I wanted to explain. Uh, it, to you in this that uh the co about the coning angle to compute our z force when we do this analysis so anyway i made a, a simple excel spreadsheet uh continued from the last analysis that i'll like to show you uh, let me try to bring that up here and uh it would be uh let's see we got it uh uh right here so in this one this is a live spreadsheet where i can um the only thing I can really vary here is the mass. So if, if we had um, um, a hundred, if we had a hundred pound blade, yeah, the coning angle is much higher because the centrifugal force isn't as high. So it makes a helicopter loader. So loader helicopters tend to have uh, maybe a, a, a higher coning angle. But I think a typical blade about this size may be about 200 pounds. So if we look, our coning angle is uh, five degrees here. Um, for a helicopter that's lifting 10,000 pounds, but if we go back, yeah, we did compute our uh, collective pitch, and uh, the overall collective pitch was 5.2 degrees, 5.248 degrees, which is very close to the coning angle. So maybe just ignoring the coning angle would be uh, the thing to do in this analysis. But if I did have a 100-pound blade, if I put a 100-pound blade in there. Yeah, then I would want to use the coning angle rather than to compute the Z forces rather than collect the pitch. If I had a 300 pound blade, a heavier blade, yeah, then it, it, it is a little bit different. So, um, and anyway, uh, this is the story on the coning angle that would uh, impact the analysis. So now I'd like to talk about the feathering, the flapping dynamics, and this is a uh, has to do with uh, longitudinal and lateral cyclic pitch and uh, this is uh, often uh, overlooked and misunderstood with helicopters and uh, the thing the conclusion is yeah feathering uh, and flapping I guess if uh, the phase lag uh, between flapping and feathering is 90 degrees so if, when you put a, a, a pitch into the blade as the azimuth changes to 90 degrees if we put our maximum feathering angle the maximum flapping will happen you know, 90 degrees later so in a lot of helicopters there's a uh, in the swash plate there's uh, pitch horns and pitch links and usually there's um a crank arm the crank arm in there uh, usually has a 90 degree offset to make up for that so the swash plate will follow the flapping but not in all helicopters so a lot of helicopters you would tilt the swash plate laterally to do a longitudinal change uh, it depends on you know the crank arms, how the pitch horn and the pitch links are set up. So we have some assumptions here. Uh, we're assuming in this simplified analysis, there's no hinge offset. So hinge offset would be uh, uh, in this representation of a blade, there would be like a uh, a little bit of extra distance here, and then and then you would have your hinge. Uh, so it's uh, assumed to be uh, this represents our blade. A rotor blade, uh, it's just like a, a log or a stick. 
say, a rectangular stick, or you, you could look at it as um, maybe a cylinder. So we assume it's a rigid body with no flexing. So this is um, just a, a rigid body. There's no elastomeric bearings. This is free to rotate. This would represent our flapping angle. And this would be free to rotate around. And this is the axis of rotation represented by omega. So we're assuming small angles. Uh, it's linearized. Assume, assume this flapping angle doesn't get very big. Um, and no lead lag. Lead lag is uh, kind of, uh, there's a lead lag hinge also, and a lot of times there's lead lag dampers added on a helicopter, so we're assuming that's like, kind of like in and out of the paper. So there's uh, also some impact on lead lag with this, but we're assuming this is two-dimensional and there's no lead lag. So we have this um, picture here that I want to talk about a little bit. So this picture depicts a, a rotor blade, uh, it's in the XY axis, axis. We, so we have an X and a Y, and, uh, and this is a, a rigid body rotor blade, and um, so there's a centrifugal force that's pulling on the blade as it spins around, and there's also lift. The thing that makes this blade tilt up is a lift, but the centrifugal force, this vector, this crank arm is canceling it out. So that's what we talked about a little bit uh, previously with the coning. But we want to talk about the dynamics of this, how this rotor blade moves, and this will help with uh, the understanding of how, how a helicopter works. So we, ha we have this um, uh, rotor blade here. So in our previous analysis, we assume the lift works off of uh, three-fourths the center of pressure is three-fourths of the root. And this analysis is going to be a little bit different. We're going to assume the lift works also on the center of the blade. And uh, this is um, uh, just, just the way, uh, this, this is the classical way that this has been looked at. And, and I guess it's more of a blade element type of analysis where we take little, little pieces. And uh, so... So in, th in this case, it's a uh, little bit, little bit different, but it's uh, pretty interesting. I'm trying to do it more in a classical way. So, so anyway, this um, blade rotates around around this axis. So there's a, a balance equation. So, so what it is, it's this the flapping angular acceleration. The flapping angle is beta times the moment of inertia of this around around this point. So when that's equal to the moment from the centrifugal force, so the centrifugal force moment would be this component, Fc sine of beta. So this has a, a negative direction. If you look at it uh, uh, using the right-hand rule, uh, this, this has a negative rotation. So this moment from the centrifugal force tends to push, pull the blade down. And then we have a, uh, another moment, and this is kind of a damping moment from the rate of change of the flapping angle. As this blade moves up, the air is going to push on this blade and try to push it back down. Uh, it's more a function of the velocity of the blade. So that's going to cause a negative moment also because the air, as this blade moves up, uh, the air is going to hit it and try to make a moment to push it back down again. So there's um, kind of like a damping term that's a function of the rate of change of the flapping angle. And then we have uh, the third term here is the moment from the lift. So there's lift working on this blade, and that's going to tend to pull it through this crank arm in this direction, which is the positive direction. So we say uh, the sum of the forces, when the sum of the forces is equal to zero, um, that's how this all adds up. So... So this this moment here would have uh, a negative sign, and this moment from the damping, the moment from the centrifugal force has a negative sign, and the moment from the damping has a negative sign, but the moment from the lift has a positive sign. So that's the uh, balance equation and a way to look at it. And we assume the centrifugal force works through, say, R over 2, which is the center of mass of this rotor blade, and we're assuming the lift is... Um, it's kind of like an element that, that works throughout the blade. So we're not uh, doing what we did before, which was the three-quarters uh, 
center pressure, but I, I'm I'm sure you know uh, if we looked at it in that way, we'd get a slightly different answer on this. But um, but this is probably good enough uh, to get a good understanding of how this works. So the first thing we want to talk about is the moment from the centrifugal force. That's this MC. That's that's this uh, force here. So some things we need to know. We need to know the mass moment of inertia for the blade. So we're assuming if we use the parallel axis theorem, if we say that uh, this is uh, kind of massless, which it's not, but we if we just moved it down to the end, that we would find out that, that the moment of inertia is uh, one fourth m r squared. Now, when you look up in your mass moment of inertia tables, you'll see um, I believe I believe around the center of this it's one twelfth times the mass r squared, but at the end. Uh, you'll see you'll get uh, one third mass times the r squared, so it's really like the one fourth uh, mon uh, plus plus the one twelfth, which gives you one third. But to keep this uh, analysis simple, we're going to assume the mass moment of inertia is this one fourth m r squared, so that keeps things uh, a little bit simpler. So the average centrifugal force for the blade is the centrifugal force is equal to the mass times the radius over 2 times the rotational angular rotational speed squared omega squared so that's um that's this force here or centrifugal force so so um so like we're we're assuming uh the force works the average centrifugal force through r2 so it's like the mass the average mass is um is, we're saying the mass the average mass is centered right here so that's why that's where the r2 is so we're saying our centrifugal forces uh, if you looked up the equation for centrifugal force it has this form mr omega squared but we divide it by two uh because we assume that the mass is uh we're working it's not a point mass but it's distributed amongst this blade so that's why we have the two there so um so we have the centrifugal force here so now we want to uh, um we want to get the moment so if we take the now uh, we said the moment has a negative sign so it's this uh, force and our crank arm is r over two times the sine of the flapping angle so so this little vector here if we took the sine of this factor here, we would get uh, this factor, uh, which is a centrifugal force times the sine of beta. Beta is a pretty small angle, so it's going to be small. But so we we're trying to get this force times this crank arm would be the moment from the centrifugal force. So if we go back down here, we wind up with this equation, the centrifugal minus the centrifugal force times the crank arm times the angle the sine of a flapping angle so if we say for since the angle is small in radians uh we could we could make an assumption that the sine of beta is approximately equal to beta so we simplify this equation a bit and say it's a centrifugal force times r over two times beta now our centrifugal force, if we plug that in, which we have over here, we plug it in here, the m r over 2 omega squared. If we plug this in here, uh, we just plug it in, and then uh, we could some, we could um, look at this uh, as uh, we have two r's here, so it's r squared, and there's a 2 times 2, which is 4, and so it's minus m r squared over 4 omega squared times the uh, flapping angle. So we saw previously, if we assume that our i is one fourth m r squared, so we have um, our one fourth m r squared here, we could just assume this being minus i omega squared beta. So, so we say our uh, moment from the centrifugal force is equal to minus i omega squared beta. So that's how that is derived. So now we're going to talk about the moment from the flapping damping. And this one is a little bit hard to understand. Um, it helps to look at this picture as this rotates up. The air is going to push on this. 
beam and try to push it back down. So if we look, if we look at that, this uh, say this is the airfoil and the blades moving. There's a, a velocity hitting it. This is the big velocity, which is our rotational speed times R is like a little element. So this this blade is moving up. It's moving up. So there's air pressure pushing down on the blade, and um, and uh, there's uh, uh, as as uh, there's a velocity uh, also. Um, as this as this moves up, there, the air pressure pushes down, and the air has a velocity, so it's it's moving, it's it's moving at um, the flapping angle rate. So it's beta dot minus beta dot r. It's going down away. It's going opposite from uh, the y-axis. So we have um, kind of a vector here that makes up this velocity that kind of defines the, the lift of the blade uh, and so we have uh, kind of this triangle here so we say as the blade rotates up around the flapping uh, angle the aerodynamic forces the aerodynamic forces will cause a damping moment and beta dot that resists the upward flapping motion so as this moves it's going to create a kind of a force that pushes the blade back down and it's a function of this angle of attack of the blade. So we say, or if you go back to the lift equation, lift is one half rho v squared s, the coefficient of lift times alpha, which is this angle of attack. So we want to define this angle of attack. So the angle of attack, by definition, is this y velocity. It's, it's the inverse tangent of the y velocity over the x velocity. Uh, for a small for a small angle of attack, it's approximately equal to the y velocity over the x velocity. So our y velocity is minus beta dot r over uh, omega r. So the r's cancel, so that's approximately is equal to minus beta dot over omega. So our angle of attack is equal to um, beta minus beta dot over omega. For this so we're trying we were trying to find what this angle of attack was uh, so so we could figure out yeah we want to be able to figure out the force this force for the damping that um impacts the blade so this is um say a little piece of our of the radius of the blade so our surface area is the cord this is the cord which is the width of, width of the blade so our uh, little little surface area, say, is our cord. Our little ele blade element here is our cord times a delta r. So if we go back to this lift equation, now now uh, the lift is also negative. It's pushing down um, because this moment's going to be negative. It's going to have a negative sign to it because it's resisting the upward motion of the blade. So the, our delta lift is one half rho v x squared so this is v v x is our omega r so that's the main velocity of that rotor blade as it spins around so our um our this is our v x squared times our surface area now is c d r times our coefficient of lift times the angle of attack so this is this is our angle of attack now and there's a minus sign there now so we could um, plug in uh, omega r for vx. So it's minus one half rho omega r squared times c times the little differential of uh, radius times the coefficient of lift times this term, which is the angle of attack. So now we're going to compute our flapping damping moment. And so uh, the, mo the moment is going to be from zero to r r delta lift so it's these little lift elements uh, we're going to integrate that all the way up so so we plug uh, our dl in here and we have this term uh, which we got from here so uh, we can um bring all this outside the integrator and what's left over uh, we have uh, r cubed dr so there was an r squared here and then we added an r which makes it r cubed dr 
So when we integrate that from 0 to r, we get r4 four, to the fourth power over 4. So it's this whole term. Uh, so there's a 4 there that we can multiply by 2 to get the 1 eighth. So it winds up being minus 1 eighth rho c, which is the core, times the coefficient of lift, times the radius to the fourth, times omega, times um, beta dot, which is our flapping angle rate. So this is our flapping angle rate. Uh, so there's some things in here like um, that are interesting that the uh, this is omega squared cancels with this omega, so it only leaves us with one omega in the equation. Uh, so so that, that uh, simplifies it a bit. And um, so this would be our, uh, represent our moment, uh, the flapping damping moment as the blade comes up. So now we're going to talk about the flapping moment from the blade pitch. So this would be, say, our uh, either, uh, our longitudinal cyclic or lateral cyclic pitch. So, um, so the blade the blade's still moving around, and we have this uh, velocity, which is omega r. But now there's a pitch, so it could be um, longitudinal or lateral cyclic pitch. This would be like uh, the AC type of pitch, not uh, necessarily collective pitch. Uh, that goes with coning, but this is uh, more of uh, the cyclic type of pitch. So. As the blade pitches, you know, it generates a lift uh, from from the velocity, from the speed. So this is the basic lift from the pitch of the blade. Assume small angles. So we have um, our lift equation again is uh, that we had uh, previously, except now instead of angle of attack, we're using the pitch of the blade. So this is the lift from the pitch of the blade. So it's one half rho times this is the velocity squared times the chord uh, dr, so this is our uh, surface area times the coefficient of lift times theta, so this is our, our lift. So now our moment, our moment's going to be, this is moment is positive, uh, so we take this and we add uh, another r to it. So we have an r cubed here now from this r squared, so the moment from our pitch is uh, we integrate it from 0 to r, 1 half rho, omega squared c coefficient of lift times the pitch angle times r3 dr so when we integrate r3 dr we get r fourth over over four so we have r to the fourth power over four so this is our equation now so we, we multiply the four by two which gives us an eighth so we bring this all down so now our um, moment this is the moment of we'll go back to the previous figure if we go way back there that's this moment here this is the moment from the lift so this is the crank arm this is our dr here and the lift goes all the way up the blade and um and and while the centrifugal force tries to bring the blade down the the moment from the pitch of the blade uh the pitch uh, as a blade moves through the air is this lift here and then we also have this damping force that works against the lift so the centrifugal force works against the lift. This damping force works against the lift. And, and this is our lift. But we have also have the acceleration times the inertia of the blade uh, as part of the equation there. So let's go back down now. And um, up we were shot a little bit. So, so anyway, this is the moment from uh, kind of from the lift of the blade over here. So now we want to use our balance equation and to get a transfer function so we're going to plug all this in we're going to plug this into this equation so we're trying to get the transfer function we want to get a transfer function a dynamic transfer function to look at so we plug this in so we have our uh, our centrifugal force moment is this minus i omega squared times the flapping angle and we have the stamping moment from the rate of change of the flapping angle and that's the minus one eighth rho c coefficient of lift r to the fourth omega times the rate of change, uh, the stamping turn of the flapping angle. And then we have this uh, moment from our lift, which is right over here. It's one eighth rho c coefficient of lift times r to the fourth times omega squared times the pitch angle. So if we plug this in and we bring um, the things that are negative we bring over to the other side and, and divide by the moment of inertia we get um 
a, a big differential equation, a second order differential equation. So it's um, beta double dot plus one eighth rho C coefficient of lift R to the fourth over the inertia times omega times the uh, beta dot. So this is our, our damping term. And then we have uh, plus omega squared beta. So this is the um, centrifugal force term over here. And that's equal, this is our lifting term over here. So now if we take the Laplace transform and we plug in S squared where we have a B double dot and, and S where we have a B dot. So now these are functions of, uh, more functions of frequency. So we have uh, our, um, uh, let's see, you have a, a little slight error here. Let me, uh, let me fix this here. This is uh, plus, okay, so we have our B to the S, S squared plus one eighth rho C times our coefficient of lift, R4 over I, omega times B to the S plus omega squared times B to the S equals one eighth rho C coefficient of lift R4 over I omega squared times theta S. Okay, so so we factor out our um, BS's here and um, we have the theta s over here so it winds up being a transfer function this would be like the transfer function of if where uh the feathering where uh the pitch of the blade say this is feathering is theta is our input and flapping is output so we get this uh differential equation here it's one eighth rho c times the coefficient of lift r to the fourth power over i omega squared over s squared plus one eighth rho c coefficient of lift r to the fourth over i omega s plus omega squared so this has um a familiar form like if we um say uh two zeta omega squared is is our numerator here one one eighth rho c coefficient of lift r fourth over i Omega squared, so we factor, we put the two down here, and we take away the omega square. We factor that out. So zeta is just equal to one sixteenth rho c coefficient of lift r four over i. For those who are in the control systems, um, uh, it has this uh, following form: the transfer function. It's a very uh, popular form for a second order transfer function. So we substitute omega n equals omega. Now, in our conventional helicopter, we're constrained that uh, we could really only run this at one frequency, which is the uh, rotational speed of the rotor. So um, it doesn't have like a, a, a filter. It's not like a filter where, um, you know, the um, the frequency could change. Okay, the frequency is constant for a conventional swash plate. So anyway, that's our transfer function there. So I made a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet to help look at this and draw out the transfer function. So we'll uh, we'll run the spreadsheet soon, but I wanted to show you, uh, this is the input. The input is um, for our helicopter here. Our input is, uh, it's a, our in bold. Okay, so plain fonts are computed and bold fonts are inputs. So we only have a couple inputs here. So one of them is RPM and then Omega is computed. And we have the uh, radius of our blade and the cord of our blade. And we have the density of air. This is at sea level and we have our mass of our blade. And um, so the mass you have to actually take it and divide it by 32.174. But we compute the, uh, from the equations above, we computed the Inertia, we assume our coefficient of lift is 2 pi. So these are the numerators and denominators of the transfer function. So, so we computed um, a zeta, and our omega is 4.17 hertz. So we're kind of constrained to that. But anyway, we will draw this frequency response as a function from 0.1 to 100 hertz. And so what we get is we get uh, a gain plot and a phase plot. So we're, uh, the helicopter, you know, being it's constrained to its rotor speed, which is 4.167, which is around to here where, where the 90 degree crossing is. 
that's where our uh, rotational speed is so that's um so that tells us yeah this says that flapping since our transfer function here is uh is flapping over feathering it's saying yeah our flapping has a minus 90 degree phase lag at the rotor speed so it's saying that we have um at the the flapping is uh, lagging the feathering by 90 degrees so this is how we prove that that on a helicopter the flapping uh, lags the feathering by 90 degrees now you can look on YouTube and look at videos they have uh, videos of cameras that are on helicopter blades where you could actually see this as the blade spins around it's uh, pretty interesting to look at uh, look at it and you could actually see this phase lag now the other real interesting thing is that you'll find with all these is that at that point the gain is also 0 dB which is a one-to-one -one gain so so at the rotor speed um, it's always it's always a one-to-one -one relationship so our so if we have one degree of feathering input a pitch input we get one degree of flapping this is relative to like these AC uh, longitudinal or lateral cyclic pitch collective pitch is a different story so that's very interesting so we have some conclusions so the conclusions from this is that flapping lags feathering by 90 degrees so that means when we put um, a pitch input in say a one degree pitch input of the blade it won't flap up until the azimuth is 90 degrees so if we put it in say at uh, zero degrees uh, you you won't uh, see it until the blade is at 90 degree position so uh, the flapping itself so the feathering is going to actually be low at that point so the other interesting conclusion is the gain is one degree per degree between flapping and feathering i want to just put at say 100 percent rpm so at the rotor that's at the the rotor speed so um it, it could be uh as things move as the frequency moves it could be different so that's um a good thing to know also that helps simplify a lot of the analysis that we do and the other conclusion is, is uh, flapping is kind of in resonance with feathering so if we look here this is actually the resonance of the second order at 90 at minus 90 degrees that's a resonant frequency so actually, I actually did a point here uh, because um, I, I skipped. I don't have exactly the 4.16 hertz in here. I put another point in here, and you could see yeah, the gain here is one, and you can see uh, you can see the the phase is minus 90 degrees. Okay, so so the uh, the zeta the zeta is kind of high here, so the damping is is pretty good with this. Unlike uh, maybe a a mechanical system you get you know, bad resonances but um so anyway so the flapping is in resonance with feathering however the damping is good on a conventional swash plate the frequency of operation is constrained to omega so there's a thing ca uh, called higher harmonic control that you could possibly do if you have independent independent blade control rather than using a swash plate where put additional actuators say on the pitch links uh, there's a thing called higher harmonic control which a lot of studies have been do have been done and that could be used um if you could actually run the rotor at higher frequencies uh while say for longitudinal or lateral cyclic pitch you could lower the if you run up here on the curve you could lower the gain so supposedly there's theories that you could get rid of a lot of the noise a lot of the vibration out of the helicopter but another neat thing about it is you could change the phase so you could you could actually control rather than it be 90 degrees let's say we had an actuator that ran at a higher frequency so we would get say 120 degrees or 140 degrees so we could actually turn the helicopter that way which would be kind of neat and you could also you could control the flapping you could get the flapping down rather than being a one-to-one -one relationship you can make the flapping some um some lower gain some uh say half or a quarter of 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 uh the uh the feathering so that would uh help you to control the flapping a lot uh so i don't believe there was there were never any helicopters in production that used higher harmonic control but it's an interesting theory and also if you went down lower 
uh, you can possibly get higher gain and um, you know, uh, maneuver the aircraft using a lower frequency. So you can't do that with a conventional swash plate, but with independent uh, individual blade control or independent blade control, I guess they call it IBC. There, are, there have been some research programs yeah, where, where you could run it like that. And so that's that's pretty interesting. So so we want to take a look at uh, the spreadsheet uh, for a few moments and try to uh, just look at how that works. So let's get that uh, spreadsheet up here. And here it is. So I can actually go in here and I could change things slightly. Like if I wanted to change the mass of the blade, things in bold, I could uh, say, say it was only 100 pounds. So now... Yeah, you can see the frequency response here change, but but the gain, if you look at it, the um, the gain is always still one to one, and the phase is ninety degrees. That's kind of locked in, so you can see how how uh, with the mass uh, you actually get a, a higher gain at the lower frequencies. If I lower the mass, if I if I make the mass three hundred pounds, no, a heavier blade it actually has like a a bigger resonance in it but uh but still uh it's locked in to uh a gain a one to one gain in 90 degrees so there's some you know, parametric variations you could do here you could change um you could change the air density if i had a lower air density um say uh, i was very high up and say it went to 0.2 you know that that would impact it you can see the frequency response change there and i'll put it back there so if the cord change if i had a one foot cord that also uh changes it quite a bit uh so uh it's interesting if i had a longer blade a 30 foot blade you know that also uh changes it also so you can play around with this and uh look at how the circuits response changes it doesn't seem to impact it at the the rotating speed but it does impact it if you had if you were using higher harmonic control and that type of thing so anyway um this this is uh the basic helicopter theory for uh feathering the flapping hi there again so although this might be a pretty boring theory this is the basic theory on uh helicopters between feathering and flapping um the main thing is that you get that 90 degrees phase shift that uh flapping lags, feathering by 90 degrees. So ho hope you enjoyed the video. I know, uh, yeah, again, they're pretty boring, but that's the theory behind it that uh, could help you with the analysis if you ever have to analyze a helicopter uh, that has longitudinal and lateral cyclic pitch. So bye now.